third and final lecture on this cruise, uh, The Miracle of Heart Disease Reversal. As we've said before, Dr. Khan is our America's Heart Healthy Doc, vegan for decades and decades. Let me see that again. <laughs> push on That's right. Um, he he uh, has his unique uh, center uh, up in Michigan and Detroit, outside of Detroit, um, for cardiac reversal. He's on the second green space cafe vegan restaurant and, uh, and food truck. I didn't know that. It's called Dad. That's funny. <laughs> so, uh, for our third and final lecture, Dr. Joel Kahn on the reversal of heart disease, all the secrets that he's done. Thank you very much. Thank you, 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 thank if you have health problems and you live anywhere near Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, that is a very, very, very smart man, truly. Um, and the check, you know where to send the check to. <laughs> um, I hope everybody's having a great time. A little sad, it's the last day, but at least the weather's beautiful. Everybody get home safe. I've enjoyed myself thoroughly. Such a, it truly is such a wonderful, wonderful crowd. And I, didn't, I wasn't aware of next year's agenda, it sounds insanely exciting. In fact, I left my very hard-working, lovely wife at home opening our second restaurant, taking care of three shelter dogs and a thousand things we do. We don't get away much. We're very uh, homebodies. But I told her, I just called her, said, we're going to Cartagena. We're going to Cartagena. Anybody see the movie Romancing the Stone? I you got it. I want to go dance in that square and having my wife wear uh, Kathleen Turner with a white cotton thing. I mean, some things, some things I don't. I want to look like Michael Douglas in that movie. I do own many, many pair of cowboy boots, and they're all vegan now. They didn't used to be. A lot of them came from that same crock that was in Cartagena. If you, if you haven't seen that movie and you're booking the cruise for next year, watch *Romancing the Stone*. I'm not sure there's a vegan theme there, but it's just a very funny movie. All right, let's talk about, you know, so many reasons why you want to give up animal products and eat plant products. Uh, one for the environment, very important. A uh, big study three weeks ago came out of, I say Oxford, I'm not sure it's the case. But, um, in fact, I just wrote a blog and it was Oxford. But that, um, by far, the best move you can make is one human on the planet trying to leave your progeny a night's planet is to stop eating animal products. And not only do plants consume less greenhouse gas, forests, water, but um, organic actually came out in the study very favorably. When you can afford to buy organic, buy organic, it even has a better impact on the environment. Of course, animal issues, it does matter. Paul McCartney of slaughterhouses had glass walls, nobody would eat meat is a very true story. I love that there's drones going now over these factory farms and exposing the horrible situations and the horrible pollution. Uh, but of course, health is what many of us gravitate to at first, either preserving good health or trying to gain back good health. It is a true statement uh, that there isn't any long-term 100% vegan community we can point to that we know for sure. There's many very, very close to completely plant-based. Um, Okinawa gets a lot of mention. Anybody ever, and I'm just rambling, but with always with the reason. Anybody ever hear of the Chimani? The Chimani is a tribe in Bolivia that live in a very primitive mountains, very isolated, T-S-I-M-A-N-E. And in uh, about April of 2017, they were splashed over every headline in the world because they actually put these people in dugouts, took them down the Amazon to medical centers, and they ran a bunch of studies on them, including that coronary artery calcium scan, the CT scan of the arteries. And they have the lowest rate of heart artery calcification at age 80 of any society ever described. In fact, majority of them have zeros at age 80, proving it's not, in, in, you know, we can say that about a lot of places, but most places haven't had testing like that as part of a research study. So these Chimane uh, had calcium scores of zero at age 80 with a very high frequency, uh, very unknown to have heart attacks there. And their diet, again, is almost uh, completely plants. It's very low in fat naturally. 
And all these longevity pockets, um, although the Chimene are not considered a blue zone, but uh, it's just one more that's been reported uh, with very detailed cardiac data. So doing it for health, but the, the biggest basis to say we can prove that this dietary pattern uh, has a dramatic health impact is in terms of heart health. And some of you will know the giants that I talk about. Hopefully I'll indicate to you at least some data you don't know. And don't leave to the end because the last 10 minutes are very, very interesting new data. All right, so if you were at my talk yesterday, I pointed out that I was very proud. I've been on the Rich Roll podcast. It's my third time this week. Rich Roll, one of the most famous plant athletes in the world, a man with an incredible story of his own, of health recovery this way, and incredible fitness. But I'm very proud to announce this was the number one podcast in the world in health yesterday on iTunes. That's a very big deal. There are thousands of health podcasts, and even Rich Roll emailed me. I checked online. He goes, this is happening. He's done 349 episodes. He goes, I don't hit number one, you know, but once in a blue moon. So I don't know what about it. I think the topic uh, just plant-based wars is one that garners a lot of attention. I'm very honored to see that. It spreads good message. But uh, when you get back, if you have an iPhone, there's a little button that says podcast. If you haven't played with it, you can search Rich Roll Podcast. I have my own podcast called Heart Doc VID, but it's a hidden jewel. I call it a P-cast because it's really like a P in a pod because I only do about 20 minutes and it's over. I don't have the patience to do two and a half hours like... Uh, ritual and I spoke. So, well, again, the touchy little button. Uh, Dr. Thomas Seidenham, by now he's the most famous dead English physician on this cruise ship. 1600s, a man is as old as his arteries. I've been reading, and uh, I've been reading a book by Paul Bragg, famous Bragg's apple cider vinegar, and he quotes Dr. Seidenham liberally in his book, so I'm glad to see that uh, a few of us recall this uh, historical figure who predicted if we knew how healthy our arteries are, we would know how healthy our whole body is. You've heard me say that if you've come to the other lectures. And I want to just briefly review, and I've been asked by some people to briefly review in literally five minutes, a brief little overview of some of that testing yesterday. Uh, we want these beautiful clean arteries to our brain, to our kidneys, to our heart artery, leading to the muscle for sure. Um, there's there's muscle there, there's cells, but the center, the circle, those are just two arteries, should be completely clean without calcium, without uh, cholesterol, without scar tissue, without white blood cells. And the Chimani in Bolivia look like that at age 80 and we can too. Oh no. But we've still got this. This is up to date data from 2015. Uh, it's not a great competition. We're still beating cancer by a bit. In Canada, that's flipped, which it should, because there's more effective strategies for heart disease than there are for cancer generally. But the societal pressures of overweight, processed food, uh, sedentary lifestyle, poor sleep has kept heart disease number one. You guys, if you're fans of Dr. Greger, you know that this is not a completely accurate chart because what's the number three cause of death in the United States? Doctors. Medical mishaps, according to Johns Hopkins University, number three cause of death, medical mishaps, about, about 200,000 deaths a year. Uh, operations gone bad, stent procedures gone bad, reactions to medication, reactions to die. Um, poor care in emergency rooms. I have, I wear a lot of hats in life. One is a very active courtroom testifying expert and the, the message of keeping yourself healthy so you don't end up in an emergency room at the mercy of somebody who may not pay attention to you the way you should be paid attention to is a very poignant one in my life, sadly. So I do believe that. Um, and that's the bad news, that's the ugly artery where there's barely any place left for blood to supply an organ. So your kidneys generally don't hurt when they're undersupplied, they just get weak and you might end up with clogged kidney arteries end up on dialysis. The heart with clogged arteries might give you that sense of pressure tightness um, called angina pain or shortness of breath. The legs will give you cramping usually in the calves. The groin area will give you erectile dysfunction, and of course, the carotid arteries, if badly narrowed, might cause a TIA, a brief inability to speak clearly or see clearly or think clearly. 
Um, and these are all critically important clues, but that's the waterfall of people falling off in emergency care when disease is far advanced. So we're going to talk about far advanced disease because reversal of heart disease was a database largely of people with bad disease. And again, some of you don't get to look at angiograms of the heart. This one created by a heart catheterization. In fact, if you look up there at the very top to the right of the arrow, that's the catheter that comes from the wrist or the groin and injects the dye down the main artery and then the front artery where the arrow is, 95% narrowed, lethal, lethal condition if not discovered and treated. Could be treated with plant-based diet if somebody's very motivated and uh, carefully watched, although that can be a lethal lesion and might be treated with a stent to rarely bypass and then apply full bore um, plant-based nutrition. The reason why it's so important you know, how many people have bypass surgery? About half a million United States stents, million, million and a half. Put a stent in that artery, but I want you to look right here. That's a different artery called the circumflex. It's about a 30% narrowing, based on my experience. If that artery were to shut, it would cause a heart attack by limiting blood down that blood vessel. The stent's gonna go just that one spot. If I look over there in the middle of the left anterior descending, there's 20, 30, 40% blockages. The majority of heart attacks occur in arteries less than 50% block that in a matter of minutes clot off, become 100% block, and create a heart attack. Now that one can do it, but more there are just more 50% blockages than there are 90% blockages in arteries. So that's why it's so important after a stent or a bypass treating that focal band-aid treatable lesion that we adopt this diet and all the data about to talk about because this is a lifelong problem and the stent does absolutely nothing to the inflammation, to the cholesterol, to the homocysteine, to the C-reactive protein, to the other factors in the blood that we can measure with great accuracy now. So, you know, give the gift if you have somebody you love that's had bypass, had stent, and they're not following a healthy lifestyle. That's a very scary proposition. There is a false sense of security. I got my stent, I went back to the cardiologist who's overweight and doesn't exercise. He didn't say anything about exercise or diet to me, and I enjoy Carl Jr., so I'm back to my old habits. That's tragic. You'll see, I'll show you data. There's a much better option to learn after a stent or bypass this lifestyle that you're seeing here. I just want to point this out again. I said that I'm going to spend five minutes, just a brief review. A deep airlobe crease is the cheapest, not highly, perfectly accurate, but maybe 60, 70% accurate clue. Erectile dysfunction, a clue. Um, I, somebody asked me specifically to talk about uh, how you can detect heart disease early when you have no symptoms. Yesterday I mentioned a carotid ultrasound that's difficult to find, done the correct way, the detailed way, uh, but extremely, extremely helpful to identify and track early disease. And this specifically, I'm doing this for an audience member, so please, 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 just show that again. If you take a note, coronary artery calcium score, a CT scan takes about less than a minute, no needles, no iodine, you want to be a B, you're probably going to do okay, but that's disease. I had somebody email me, I get funny emails. I'm a vegetarian except for the chicken, the pork, the turkey, and the beef that I eat. I guess they have a salad with their... And, uh, you know, four years ago my calcium score was 12, and I had a heart attack, and I'm so ticked off about you guys talking about you can prevent this with vegetarian diet. So that's not a vegetarian diet. And 12 isn't zero. Um, and 12, four years ago, isn't 12 now, because this will be worse, and almost all plaque has calcium detectable. It's not 100%, it's very rare, but you can have this test come out normal and end up with difficulties. It's just very, very rare. Um, so let's talk about the main topic now, which is the reversibility of a disease that a lot of us have, may not know it, may have it at a very early age, may not have it ever show up during your lifespan, but it'd be better not to have it and to get rid of it if you could. Food is medicine, I'm gonna go through that. So this observation may be well known to many of you, um, and for those that haven't seen it, it's important to point it out, because it was the basis of a whole uh, series of studies. 
But this is data that was published right after World War II from the country of Norway that was invaded by Germany, had very good records on diet and death for a variety of causes. And in analysis, what happened to the number of deaths during World War II when the Nazis occupied Norway uh, considered accurate data. And against all you know, reasonable predictions, given the stress and the difficulty and the poverty of two or three years of occupation, there was a rather dramatic drop in deaths that quickly, right after the war, came back up. And in a paper published soon after the war, it was hypothesized that the strategy of the German regime was to take animals out of countries they occupied, back on trains to the uh, native land to feed soldiers, feed the administration, feed the population, leaving Norway largely a nearly completely plant-based country, sort of like Finland I talked about, but a dramatic and forceful way to change the diet of a country. And this was noticed by a number of people as a clue that death was uh, dependent on lifestyle to some degree, and death was dependent on diet to a large degree. And uh, these researchers set the pace for the names you know, but I want to show you some of them. So I won't talk at length about a Dr. Kempner. If you're a fan of nutritionfacts.org, you may know his name, a German Jew that came over right before World War II to Duke. Duke was a little tiny backwater medical school. Dr. Kempner set up a lab to study low-fat diets with very little animal foods, uh, starchy foods, a lot of rice, fruit and demonstrated in very well accepted scientific studies you could reverse many kinds of heart disease, kidney failure, diabetes, and obesity with a low-fat starchy diet, sort of the precursor to John McDougall, published many papers, established what was called the Duke Rice Diet, which became wildly popular for about 25-30 years. They treated almost 20,000 people there as inpatients, including people like Buddy Hackett, Elizabeth Taylor, Lauren Green, it was the place to go to rejuvenate and lose some weight for your next movie. Um, how many people think the next picture's got a little humor? So that's supposed to be a, a Dr. Morrison, Lester Morrison, I'm gonna show you some data, but uh, he's a difficult man to find a picture of, apparently. That's, uh, that's the door, Ms. Morrison. I won't talk about Roy Swank, but many, again, are very knowledgeable people. A professor of neurology at the University of Oregon in Portland, who did a trial that ended up 50 years of using a plant diet in multiple sclerosis, very careful clinical evaluation showing that people stayed in remission far more uh, than expected using a low-fat plant diet, uh, published the data uh, all the way through 50-year follow-up. The only comment on his evaluation was there weren't MRI scans, because there weren't any at the beginning of the study, and, uh, counting the number of plaques in the brain on MRI is felt to be a scientifically valid way. So Dr. McDougall did a one-year study to reproduce the Swank diet. Couldn't show in just one year that MRI <coughs> scans differed. People did feel better. So it's left it a little up in the air, but you would do a great gift to anybody with multiple sclerosis to, there actually are books called The Swank Diet for Multiple Sclerosis. And they're very consistent with everything you learned. I talked two days ago about Dr. Hansel Keyes, but let's, when uh, uh, Senator McGovern was involved in dietary guidelines, but let's talk about Nathan Pritikin and some of the others and how that relates to Norway. So this doesn't say it here. This is a research study done by a Dr. Lester Morrison who looks a lot like a singer for the doors. Dr. Lester Morrison was an internist in Los Angeles, very big practice, big cardiology practice, and he was aware of this Norway data. And right after the war, he said to half of 100 patients, I want to put you on the ever-popular Nazi diet. No, no, nobody's ever written a book called Eat Like a Nazi. Uh, it, it, it might work, it wouldn't sell, it would be offensive. But he did put this together in a way that he reproduced what he imagined the diet in Norway must have been. And half of those 100 people ate that way. They all had had previous heart attack. Half were told just keep eating the way you eat. You can see what it does for weight, and you can also see how much people weighed back then. The men in the group reduced their weight from 166 to 141. Pretty hard to find a 166-pound man nowadays. Women, 145 to 124. And some of you have booked appointments with me to talk about your cholesterol. 312 to 220. This is 
you know, 30 years before a cholesterol medicine was really on the market that might have worked. People reported feeling well, exercise, and all the rest. So, I mean, the list of foods, this was published in 1951. This is um, many years, uh, 30 plus years before Dr. Horner's studies. No cream soups, no organs, no whole dairies, no egg yolks. I think it's really interesting to go to the very bottom because we all struggle with the, what's with the no olives, no nuts, no avocados, just plain Dr. Morrison, he kind of set the tune, you know, even here, olive oils, vegetable oils are out, cookies, cakes, didn't like sugar, particularly didn't like oils and creams, he didn't like excess sugar either, and obviously these are, you know, most of these foods, cookies, cakes are combinations of excess sugar, processed flour, refined flour, added oils and fats, and he did this diet, and you saw some of the results, their weight and their cholesterol, but he published data, dramatic data, that if you're the red bar low fat group eating like Norway, or you're the rest of Los Angeles eating like a bunch of uh, overfed pigs, you see the difference in survival. I mean, it's dramatic data that in 12 years, half the people are alive. This is a time no bypass, no angioplasty, no stents, no heart transplants, and very little medication, but uh, very dramatic effects. So Dr. Morrison is largely forgotten. Anybody that lives in Los Angeles, if you go to Cedars, you go to the cardiology auditorium, it's called the Morrison Cardiology Auditorium. I lectured there in September and asked the large group who knew who Dr. Morrison was, and unfortunately he's a forgotten figure. But he does deserve a big shout out, and more important, the data is still highly relevant in a world that's very confused about this low-fat diet. And, you know, if you were to eat fats, so eat whole food plant fats like avocados, oils, and nuts, unless you're one of the heart patients that are trying to reproduce what uh, Dr. Morrison showed. So when we move on, the next hero here, somebody who knew of the Norway data, was a biospace engineer living in Santa Barbara, California, who um, had a very bright mind that went way beyond just aerospace, even though he had 30 or 40 patents, was building parts for the Air Force, uh, had a thriving business. But he was aware of what was going on in L.A. with Dr. Morrison. In fact, he booked an appointment with Dr. Morrison when he was about 41 years old just to go for a checkup because he kept hearing this word cholesterol and, and uh, this issue, and he ate a, a very typical poor quality Western diet. Uh, he went there and had his finger poked and found out his cholesterol was over 300 and 41 or 42, and Dr. Morrison had him do an old-fashioned stress test called a master's two-step. Just go up two steps, down two steps, up two steps. Do it long enough, you might develop tightness, you might develop shorter breath, you might develop changes on your electrocardiogram, and he actually flunked that stress test at age 41 or 42. Dr. Morrison gave him a very scary prognosis, which is very appropriate in 1952, 53, 54, and he told him about this data he had, and Mr. Pritikin was very bright, very motivated, very focused. He goes, I can do it, I can even do it better than you're doing it. And he adopted the diet, and he lost weight, and he brought his cholesterol down to 120 from over 300, and he started running. And he never stopped running his whole life. He lived uh, way beyond predictions and uh, lived into, uh, died in 1985 in his mid 70s of a non cardiac disorder. He ultimately had normal stress tests, he re reversed his heart disease in terms of stress tests. He never had an angiogram, but it, you may know this, uh, but he wrote in his will, I believe I've reversed this evidence I had blocked arteries in the early 50s. And when I have a, when I die, I want an autopsy, I want it published in a medical journal, and he had influence by that time to arrange all that. And that was done, and his heart arteries were completely clean, not like that widow make lesion I showed you, that was, published uh, soon after his death in the New England Journal of Medicine as a shred of data, not a huge piece. There may be dramatic reversible potential if you stick with uh, you know, a rigid dietary program for decades and decades like he had at that point. But he not only built, car, uh, built parts for the Air Force, he started accumulating more experience with his own health, started giving some advice to people who asked him, Ultimately, he established in a series of hotels on the west coast the Pritikin Center and started accumulating data before there were computers, just little pieces of paper and cards. Ultimately, you can see over 4,000 people. This was published in 1991. It's not Dr. Neil Barnard. It's another Barnard working with Mr. Pritikin. 
showing when you ate a plant diet, very, very low in added fats and total fat calories. You could drop your cholesterol, you could drop your triglycerides, and you could lose body weight. And he demonstrated also an economic benefit that these people were admitted to the hospitals less frequently needed. By this time, there was bypass, there was balloons. They needed cardiac procedures less and less. I will point out, these people did better, but during this diet, they dropped their HDL cholesterol. It's a very common criticism of plant-based diet, you know, that some of the data suggests HDL, the happy cholesterol, that used to be a very simple statement, high HDL good, low HDL bad, Framingham data from the 1960s. So you guys are crazy, you're following a diet that drops your HDL, what a horrible thing. But in this study of thousands of people, it didn't matter because they're, the real issue of were they healthy, did they have good longevity, did they need bypass stents, and there was you know, quality data with quality follow-up suggested maybe we don't understand HDL well and maybe this isn't so bad because people are actually doing better. Um, you'll see in a little bit another major study showed the same thing. And now in 2018, we actually don't know very well much about HDL as the reasonable cardiology conclusion. There was a study two months ago, people with very high HDL, way over 100, had twice the death rate of people with more normal HDLs. So what the, how can that be? Um, and there are better and better HDL tests that will be coming out in 2018 that will tell us more. So the routine HDL should be measured, but don't freak out if it drops while you're doing everything right. Freak out a little if it's super high, but it's not highly predictive. Some people think a super high HDL, it's clearly sometimes genetic, but it can be a reaction like the C-reactive protein inflammation. Uh, pomegranate juice is supposed to make your HDL work better. This diet overall appears to make your HDL work better, this lifestyle. So Pritikin was a very humble man. All I'm trying to do is wipe out heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. He ended up going on 60 Minutes show in 1977 talking about how as a non-physician he was changing the course of American health. It was the most popular interview in 1977 for the entire year for 60 Minutes. He became wildly popular. Certainly was resisted by the medical community for a long time. Somebody stole his data and published his data because he wasn't an MD and shouldn't be publishing data. Ultimately with the establishment of his center in California, it moved to uh, South Beach, it's at the Doral Country Club now, it's a very established, wonderful place. If you, know, if you need to follow up from this trip with a, another exposure, not on a cruise ship, 10 days, seven days at the Pritikin Longevity Center in South Beach would be a very wonderful exposure and a, and a beautiful setting. You can walk into the Doral Country Club and get a steak, but they encourage you to come over here and eat with the Pritikinites, of course, because you're there to learn and do lectures and exercise. A pretty intense week. There's medical doctors there, so you get a very complete checkup. So Mr. Pritikin lives on through his foods, his books, um, his legacy, Dr. Gregor's grandmother. But, you know, we've never had on the cruise, and I don't think we will because of his speaker's fee, Dr. Dean Ornish, pictured here next to his rabbi. No, not quite his rabbi. So, Dr. Ornish, uh, who's become a friend in the last few years, I had to work on that for 25 years to say that, um, he's a man, he's so busy. I left him a phone message about seven years ago uh, with a specific question introducing myself. I got a call back 10 months later with, hi Joel, I'm answering your message. <laughs> As if it was, you know, 10 minutes later. But he is standing here next to a man who influenced him greatly. It's a cute little story. This is a yogi named Sachi Dananda. I understand some of you were actually at Woodstock in 1969. I heard this in an elevator talk. Sachi Dananda gave the introductory blessing to the whole Woodstock weekend. Uh, he's a very well-known yogi and philo philosopher. He's written some amazing books. I've read some of them. Uh, really non-religious books about peace and meditation and food and health and general spirituality. But when uh, Dr. Ornish was 13, that's a true story, he grew up in Dallas, his father was a prominent dentist. Um, they were already interested in alternative you know, medicine and philosophies. Instead of a bar mitzvah party, his parents brought Sachi Dananda to their house 
and uh, spent some time and it resonated with Dr. Ornish, a very sensitive and wonderful man. And he became a student of his and adopted yoga and meditation and healthy plant diet that Sachi Dananda taught. And when he got into medical school, he took a year off to do a very small study where he put, I remember, 18 patients in a hotel for four weeks, got a little money as a medical student, fed them what became known as the Ornish diet. I'll show you in a minute. And documented some common question, how quickly when I adopt this diet can I help my heart? He documented in a small group of 18 heart patients that were having angina. The, the blood pressure, the cholesterol, and actually the stress test improvement. Their stress test done before and after improved in just four weeks. Dramatically interesting results published initially in 1979 and then actually published in a very prominent medical journal in 1983. But didn't make a splash because it's easy to say placebo, there was no control group, um, it's 18 patients, you can't reverse heart disease, you know, who's the yogi? They, he didn't mention the yogi. But even then, because of this influence, it was a program of diet, walking, stress management with yoga, social support, love, Dr. Ornish is uh, the equivalent of Dr. Ruth in terms of love and emotions and um, his next book is supposed to be out soon. It's called Undo, about undoing stress. He always jokes, I'm not a Hindu, I'm an undo. Um, and it's a rather important, uh, I, I give him credit for keeping our uh, toolbox broad. It's, it's food plus. And he did, in fact, tell you, he's not sure if it isn't the social support and all that adds to longevity as much as the food. The food's critical. A little different philosophy. The Ornish diet every year gets named the number one heart diet in the world by U.S. News and World Report, next to a nice piece of salmon, which is never on that diet. Uh, and U.S. News and World Report is a pretty decent place to look. If you don't follow this, what's of interest when we talk about this food war thing is the ketogenic diet, and, which uh, is what that podcast with Rich Rolls about, and the paleo diet are judged independently by U.S. News and World Report as diet number 29 and number 30 out of 30 for support in number one up here is Ornish. So uh, they don't talk about that much and just criticize the manner in which the U.S. News and World Report creates these lists. But uh, it's an independent assessment that you give you a little bit of uh, support that you, know, you are eating on the right side of the food pyramid that uh, Juliana Heber and Ray Cronice created that's just absolutely awesome. So the Ornish diet is very much like the Pritikin diet, is very much like the Lester Morrison diet, but it's more than a diet. Vegetables, fruits, beans, legumes, whole grains, non-fat products like cereals and soups, but you see something here. He did let people eat egg beaters and egg whites. This is 1987, 1988. You weren't gonna find very many Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, ThriveMarket.com, and if you don't know what ThriveMarket.com is, you should check it out on the web and See why you basically have a Whole Foods market in every city in the United States if you just go online, thrivemarket.com. Many, many, many Whole Food vegan items, gluten-free items if you want. Um, and he also let people eat a little non-fat yogurt. Again, because they were whining, it was a difficult time compared to the availability nowadays of Kite Hill almond yogurt if you want to eat that. Um, and the most important was the addition of walking every day like Nathan Pritikin yoga every day of any type you wanted. Sachi did not influence, of course, not smoking. And pretty much a Lester Morrison list of what you shouldn't do, oils, meats, olives, avocados, nuts, and seeds. I'll forget to mention it. I think in April of last year, Dr. Ornish's website, ornish.com, had an article by a dietitian where they announced after doing this for nearly four years that a handful of walnuts added to the daily diet was now permitted, you know, officially by the Ornish program, Ornish Lifestyle Program. But there was so much data that a small amount of whole walnuts, why walnuts, they're very, very rich in omega-3 fatty acids, unlike almonds, cashews, and the others, they can have benefit, I'm not saying never eat them, Brazil nuts lower cholesterol, Brazil nuts have selenium, but if you had to pick one nut and you've been told to be very cautious about the number of nuts, walnuts, uh, are what I would advise you to do. And I do not know why you can't buy walnut butter. You can make your own, but probably it's a good thing because you'd smear so much on, it'd be a lot more than five or six anyways. It seems the best route is just 
whole walnuts. So, um, Dr. Ornish published first in 1990 uh, the results to follow up on that early study that people criticized. This study had a control group. Half of you heart patients eat the American Heart Association diet. Half of you follow my lifestyle and food pyramid with the most sophisticated follow-up in terms of angiogram data. This was answered every question people had criticized about that early study. Um, I started my practice July 1, 1990. I've already been a plant eater for 13 years. This journal came to my mailbox three weeks after I started my job. I thought I was the most knowledgeable cardiologist because I know how to put a balloon up your nose and down your toes. And this challenged me, because this is just my personal story, because I already was eating this way, and then I read this article the day it came out to my mailbox. No, no online journals back then. I knew who these co-authors were, very, very well-known docs. I said, this is pretty amazing that you can reverse this disease with more than a balloon. So my personal story is I started teaching Ornish medicine early on, 1998, he took those patients and followed them up five years later to look a little deeper into what happens if you continue to eat a 10% fat, whole food, vegetarian diet because the egg beaters and the non-fat dairy being permitted, aerobic exercise, stress management, smoking cessation, group support for five years. And this is a graph I have hanging on the wall of my office. I wish every cardiologist was required to tattoo this on their prescription pad or arm or such, because this is the results five years. These people agreed to have a catheterization at the beginning, one year, and five years. There is that newer test where you can get that data by a CT scan without going up inside of you. We haven't yet had a plant-based research study with the newer technology. So he did three angiograms on these people. He was not a, he's not a cardiologist, he's an internist, so he had cardiologists do them. And then they shipped the data over to Houston where they had the best computer research lab and they measured very precisely how much blockage was in the arteries. They came up with an average. So at the beginning of the study, the group that was told to eat like the American Heart Association control black dots had 41% blockage on average in the heart arteries. So did the group that was assigned to follow his complete program. And over those five years, the differences were dramatic. Things got worse and worse and worse when you follow the American Heart Association diet, and things got slowly but steadily better. The first time ever documented directly that years of atherosclerosis can be reversed, not to 0% in five years. Maybe Mr. Pritikin was able to reverse his disease to zero on autopsy in 30 years. But because of the nature, if anybody's an engineer, a very small improvement in the area opening of an artery is a very big improvement in blood flow because it's to the fourth radius squared, if I remember my physics. So even a millimeter of improvement is a dramatic increase in blood flow when you're exercising or cold weather, or making love or running upstairs or whatever. So that uh, associated with this difference in the results was a tremendous difference in the way people felt and the way people showed up in emergency rooms, needed bypass, needed angioplasty, dramatic clinical differences. And although that paper I showed you was 1998, it took um, many years, is that 12 more? Yeah, 12 more years to the year 2010, and Ornish ultimately got several thousand patient data points on what happens when people with heart disease follow his program, what happens to cost, which is usually what insurance companies care about the most. The Pritikin program put together data with thousands of patients. They both happened to submit it to Medicare the same year with these thousands and thousands of patients. And Medicare approved two programs and only two programs. If you're a heart patient who's had a recent heart attack, stent, bypass, valve replacement, transplant, or if you've had chronic angina. There's a few people out there that every time they get on the treadmill or walk up a hill, they get tightness, they stop, it goes away in a minute or two. They are either not ideal candidates for bypass or a stent, or they don't want to bypass or a stent, hopefully also treated with some reasonable medication, aspirin and the like. But they approve payments for what's called intensive cardiac rehab. So this is where you go in and you do a little exercise, and there's people around, usually at a hospital, and your blood pressure is monitored, and usually your EKG is monitored but very different than standard cardiac rehab, of which in my career I've been a director of a program for 10 years in the past doing cardiac rehab in my local hospital. This included cooking classes, yoga sessions, 
group support psychological sessions. It really was a repeat of the whole Ornish study. And they've seen dramatic improvements. And it's the program you'd like your loved one to go through if they met those five or six criteria. Which unfortunately, if you just show up and say, I know I've got blockage, I feel fine, I want the Ornish or the Pritikin program, um, you won't get it paid by insurance because they're all reviewed for payment unless you meet those criteria. It would seem like a really good idea to do it uh, and pay for it to prevent the bypass and the expensive stent and certainly the incredibly expensive uh, transplant and such. Around the country, there's maybe a hundred of these programs at most. In my state of Michigan, there's only one in Ann Arbor, and it's the Pritikin variety. It takes one, a commitment from a hospital or a team. You need a psychologist and a dietitian and a doctor and a phys exercise person and uh, some other people in a space. It can be done in an office, but it's usually a hospital. You also need a uh, administration favorable because um, you know this works so well, they might not come back for their next stent, their next bypass and all that, and uh, when the hospital administrators and chiefs of cardiology are eating uh, steaks, you know, they may not be so favorable. It's very profitable, so if anybody's on the board of a hospital, these programs make a lot of money for hospitals. Uh, in Ann Arbor, they've made so much money the first couple of years, the popularity, the success, they've just expanded the program tremendously, um, but it's just a little disappointing how accessible it is. Uh, but it, you know, when people challenge you, well, that that paleo diet, and you need meat, and you're hurting yourself, and you say, you know, do you have Medicare approval for that paleo diet that you're following for heart disease reversal? I mean, government carefully, carefully looked at data before saying we'll pay millions of dollars for people going through these programs. It's very, very powerful supportive data. Um, Ornish didn't stop with dramatic heart disease data. He's still a very active researcher in red. It's impossible to read. This is an article by him. It's very important to point this out. He took at the University of California, San Francisco with the chief of urology, Dr. John Carroll, a world famous urologist. 93 men, and very often when you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, the advice, thank goodness, is well, watchful waiting, not surgery, not chemo, not radiation. And they took 93 men like that. Half of them were told, we'll just see you on a yearly basis. Half of them were taught how to do the complete Ornish program of diet and stress and all. At a year, the marker in the blood of cancer activity fell when you eat your vegetables and manage your stress. It goes up when you just see your urologist. They took the blood of these people and dripped them in petri dishes on prostate cancer cells and your blood becomes like chemotherapy within just three months. It was very able to kill cancer cells to a degree much more than the control group, eight times more. And then for the first time, because one of Dr. Ornish's real um, strengths is he's very well known and he can get co-authors. So one of his co-authors ultimately won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for something called telomeres and aging research. So they took uh, these patients at three months and they analyzed the activity of genes in their body that have to do with cancer. And they showed within just three months of eating plants, managing stress, and walking, you um, turned on genes that are involved with fighting cancer in uh, your own immune system. And you turned off genes that seem to promote cancer, like growing blood vessels and feeding cancer cells. So that within just three months, you can dramatically alter and there's people on the boat that have these dramatic, dramatic stories. Christine Fox, if she's here, I don't know, of you know cancer remission with diet and lifestyle. And one has to be very cautious, uh, but that would give some scientific basis for how that can happen. Now, how many urology patients ever know of this? Dr. Warnish has never written a book. I wish he would, even a short one on prostate cancer. There's plenty of ways to just go. These are all published in premier journals that all doctors and the public can access, uh, but sadly it's not taught and should be. Um, Undo Your Prostate, which should be the subtitle of his book. In 2008, and he followed up in 2013, he actually looked at a sophisticated issue about potential longevity. Does the Ornish program suggest you can live longer following the whole program? One way to try and assess that is to measure an enzyme called telomerase. That's an enzyme that won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in about 2015 for Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn. And he showed that there's more activity to this enzyme, which suggests uh, more anti-aging and disease uh, resistance 
than on a controlled diet by following the program. So again, not that we need to be aggressive and mean to people, but when somebody says, where do you get your protein? You can, in a very sophisticated way, say, where do you get your telomerates? Because <laughs> be a good t-shirt, no doubt. Uh, where do you get your cancer regression? Where do you get your heart disease regression? Where do you get your Medicare approval? On and on. Well, everybody's best friend, the big smiling Dr. Hesselston, to show you his data. Not that it isn't worth going deep into it, but just for sake of time. Some of you don't know this story, Dr. Hesselston, his wife, Ann Cryle Hesselston, is a legacy. Her grandfather founded the Cleveland Clinic, a surgeon. She grew up there. Dr. Esselstyn, uh, he's from, if you don't know this, he's, his family owns a farm in upstate New York. It's one of the 10 oldest family farms in America from like 1650. But he trained at the Cleveland Clinic as a surgeon, concentrating on thyroid and breast disease, had a long and very prestigious career, won a gold medal at the Olympics, and won an award in Vietnam as a physician. But there was a day in the early 1980s that he had to share a locker for a few months due to some construction going on at the Cleveland Clinic. And they did it alphabetically, and Hesselstyn is an E, so who's enough? It was Dr. Rene Favalero. Dr. Favalero from Argentina was the first surgeon in the world to do bypass surgery in 1969. So these two guys of about the same age were sharing their gym shoes and their, and their scrubs in the same locker and became fast friends. And Hesselstyn had the bright enough mind and Favalero knew it too. You don't really do anything to cure disease during that bypass. You're just rerouting stuff, right? And in Hesselstyn said, I'm just cutting out cancer. I'm not really doing anything to change the chance of getting recurrent cancer, right? Right? So he started reading and studying and he read about Norway and he read about Pritikin and Morrison, and uh, Ornish data wasn't published at this time, so he wasn't actually aware of Dr. Ornish for a few years. Uh, very few of us were. But he created with his wife, Anne, a little pilot program where he went to the cardiologists and surgeons at the Cleveland Clinic and said, give me those that you can treat, those that are just too sick for bypass, too sick for stents and balloons, and let me try and reproduce Norway and Papua New Guinea and the Chimene in Bolivia and feed them like we're eating upstairs on the 14th floor uh, without uh, those foods that are believed to damage arteries, damage endothelium. Uh, create a diet that's naturally low in fat because all foods have them, even the humble potato has some fat. Uh, leafy greens have fat, but uh, we can, and he used cholesterol lowering medication, which was now on the scene if needed. Uh, no formal exercise philosophy, no formal meditation uh, philosophy. There was group support. This is the famous general surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic who could no longer operate and was very frustrated that he was told by the people there that your, your blockage is not good for balloon or bypass. Uh, hum, uh, quietly walked in Dr. Hesselstyn's office and said, I'm ready to do this and repeat angiogram, one of the most stunning and most famous repeat angiogram pictures we have entirely due to plant-based eating, plant eating, no egg whites and no egg beaters and no non-fat dairy officially permitted in Dr. Heston's diet. Another blockage where the black arrow is on the right that was much better. Dr. Heston never had the funding that Dr. Ornish did, so these were clinical observations. These were looking how often people were admitted to emergency rooms before and after they adopted what many people call the SE diet. Uh, dramatic data, I'm sorry. Uh, Dr. Kim Williams, who uh, a year and a half ago, longtime friend of mine, cardiologist, spent a lot of time in Detroit as a chief of the department, uh, made this famous statement, there are only two kinds of cardiologists, vegans and those who haven't read the data. You know, and certainly in your face, how can you not talk to patients about this wealth of data, never big enough, never large enough, but the Medicare data particularly is large and impactful, and it's still never going to be presented in almost all cardiology conferences <coughs> in the country. Um, the largest concentration of plant cardiologists is now at the University of Chicago, where Dr. Williams is chief. There's nine of 20 cardiologists that are plant-based, uh, and his strong influence and leadership but for most hospitals at zero or one. Dr. Williams has another quote, maybe you know this, which is, I don't mind dying, I just don't want it to be my own fault. Um, and that has taken on a legacy, because if you Google that, I don't mind dying, I just don't want, people now have that on t-shirts and pillows and coffee mugs and 
it was no business he started up, but usually they put his name underneath and at least give him the credit, you know, that, and that's not a bad philosophy to follow anyways. I mentioned briefly yesterday, this is what I call Plants Plus, because in my particular training of integrative medicine, the background that Dr. Blyweiss has been studying and leading much longer than me, there are enough data to consider adding certain things to a plant diet, particularly for heart patients, maybe for everybody. And one is the difficulty in getting a vitamin that's involved in whether your arteries get calcified in age or not, vitamin K2, found in a soy product called natto, common in Japanese diet, very uncommon in American Western diets or Western diets in general, and data from a study of over 4,000 people that the higher your blood level, actually the higher your dietary intake, then presumably the higher your blood level of vitamin K2, the less calcified are your arteries and the less events. I mean, would you mind taking a vitamin that has data suggesting less artery damage and less artery death uh, without completely firm data? I mean, that's an individual decision. It, enough that many multivitamins add vitamin K2 to them, not all. Uh, Dr. Furman's does, I'll show you another one in a minute. Uh, it's a consideration, but in my practice, if you're a heart patient with a calcium score, you're going to be on vitamin K2, and I use a brand that has 320, it's called UG, which is microgram, not milligram. Um, recently, there's a new, I don't know if Dr. Blavis is still here, but you have in your cells mitochondria, a little bit of a, here's your heart squeezing, and inside every cell are thousands of, they're called the powerhouses of the cell. And there's a new role of vitamin K2 in helping mitochondria function more efficiently. So there's some new data that if you're an athlete and you're on vitamin K2 supplements or placebo, you actually get a little extra endurance, which to some athletes might be a big deal. There's some suggested data, higher blood levels of K2 and less diabetes, less dementia and less cancer also that exist. There's an article out there in the web I've written about vitamin K2 and heart disease somewhere. I'm trying to be gentle with this, there we go. Um, there is a, a topic called chelation, plants plus, plants are awesome. Just expanding your mind, but always staying where there's literature and science that it may be possible to remove plaque and calcified plaque from arteries using chemicals. The story, the backdrop story, I'm going to then, is um, in Detroit, in our auto industry days, many people were getting exposed to large amounts of lead and mercury, particularly lead. If you fell in a vat of paint at a Ford plant in Dearborn, Michigan, you were exposed to an enormous amount of lead and you were at risk of your very health and survival. And at Ford Hospital, which is about half an hour from the plants, they developed a program of giving these people in the 60s and 70s intravenous chemicals that they knew existed that can bind lead, mercury, calcium, and remove it from the body, and they saw a dramatic improvement. And there is actually a FDA, or no, there's an insurance reimbursement for treating people with lead and mercury um, toxicity with chemicals called chelating agents. But there was this rumor that maybe this also helped heart disease, that these patients that were being treated for environmental and accidental overdoses reported their blood pressure was better, they were breathing better, their chest pain was better. It became rumored, but it was only a rumor, you couldn't find much science until 2012. And in 2012, a large study done at University of Miami, right where the CME program is from, demonstrated convincingly there was reason to believe this might actually work. This is some results on somebody with a very high calcium score using an oral form of chelating agent that has some scientific support. I showed you this yesterday only because it's interesting and I apologize for the trigger finger. This is the study from University of Miami published November 2012. Major medical center, major journals, respected scientists, not, not uh, fly by the night snake oils. But if you could choose, if you were a heart patient with diabetes and you could choose to be the purple or the blue line at the top, which is the number of events you had in the five years following the study, getting placebo, placebo intravenous and a placebo multivitamin, or you could be the green line getting real multivitamins and real intravenous chemical called EDTA chelation. There was a big difference, and it launched another ongoing study right now at the University of Miami, funded by our government uh, all over the United States to try and prove definitively that this may become available. But it is available already 
in your town, somebody has IV chelation available, somebody has oral chelation available. It's a consideration, it's something I use on occasion. Uh, this is that carotid, and this is a nice one, it's different than the one I showed yesterday. This is a way to make me a mini little Dr. Ornish using this carotid scan that takes about 20 minutes, no radiation. You can do this a series of times and actually see if your plaque is getting worse or not in a very quantitative, objective way. So what that says is this was the right carotid that was 35% blocked in December of 15, and within less than two years, it says it's 23% blocked. And on the left side, it was 41% blocked, and now it's down to 21% blocked, plus other measurements, 34% blocked, down to less than 20. And then the T is for thickness, and this is the measure. This Initially, the thickness of this gentleman's arteries were 1.1. It went down, got improved. So originally, this said he was 74 years old, and he had the arteries of a 90-year-old, and it actually came down. And he started eating plants without oils, and he took vitamin K2, and pretty sure he did some oral chelation. There's some other tricks there. But it is possible to reproduce some of this data using the diet that we uh, teach, but also adding integrative medicine, recognizing we don't have enough data, we have data, we don't have enough data, but if you had disease, would you want to try some of this stuff? You know, some patients do and are willing. Quick little case study, famous in Michigan, more on the diabetic side of things than the cardiovascular side of things. Mark Ramirez, 1990, he's a tackle, University of Michigan football team, Rose Bowl trip three times, fit, big guy, um, family riddled with diabetes, he's Latino, and there's a very high rate of type 2 diabetes in the Latino population. And by age 30, he's an AT&T exec, he's got kids. Um, I haven't looked at this a while because I know his daughter now, he's probably about 27 or 26, I see a face. But anyways, clearly overweight, no longer the football player buff guy that he was. Age 30 told, you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and you're a diabetic type 2, just like your mother, your brother, your sister, who have had dialysis and amputation and eye problems. And he gets on the whole regimen from age 30, 35, 40. And about age 44, his in-laws give him a very powerful gift. They give him a copy of Four Silver Knives and Dr. Barnard's book. And uh, he gets serious about it that day with his lovely wife, Kim. And if I can go backwards... Uh, you know, the transformation to being off all medication within six months, including Viagra, return of all function, including Viagra assisted function without the blue pill. Um, now being an educator all over the country has been written up in Fort Silver Knives magazine. He's helping a lot of athletes who are in the same pickle he was in, being 35, 40, and being very overweight because, you know, you're used to eating these massive amounts, you're no longer working out and life gets to you. So uh, that's just one dramatic and real life example. Uh, how many people can we help? Here's an estimate that if the whole planet started eating what the picture shows, we'd save eight million lives and help the planet dramatically. This wasn't research from Dr. Neil Barnard, that very aggressive vegan uh, researcher. This is Oxford University, a very independent scientific panel. And uh, so we know we can go Worse with age, we can go better with age. Very exciting data should always be our goal to try and maintain our whole life arteries like a baby or a young adult. But if we end up in a pickle where we do have lesions, we have very powerful tools to work on them naturally. All right, uh, about 10 more minutes I'm done, but last 10 minutes I said were fun. Problems that we can face in vegans because we can do it right or wrong is the difference between these two slides, pretty obvious. Harvard School of Public Health published a paper last year. If you analyze dietary patterns in over 100,000 nurses and doctors, those that could be described as healthy plant patterns had a very big drop in heart attack risk over 30 years of health. Those that could be described as junk food vegan diets had actually an increase in the risk of heart disease over what they call the Western diet. So, um, you know, eating uh, too many junk foods. Uh, in the plant world is a very uh, big problem. It may be that we're better vegans with supplements. As I said, there's really no natural society. We know we can get almost every nutrient in a better mix of every nutrient with whole foods. 
but we are challenged with a few things. So Dr. Greger and others have the big three, I'll show you more than the big three, but vitamin D, B12, and the algae-based omega-3 that maybe everybody should take every day and just say, yep, we don't have to necessarily take metformin, necessarily take lisinopril for blood pressure, necessarily take Cialis, and necessarily take the rate of chemotherapy that others take, but we have to take three little vitamins and maybe cost a dollar and 25 cents a day to protect our health. There's a couple easy ways to get them in combination vitamins. This is my favorite. I don't own these companies. Pure Synergy is an organic vitamin company out of Utah. This multivitamin has not only the D, um, the B12, it actually has a little zinc, which some data suggests we can have a trouble getting. It has a little iodine, which some studies say we can have a little trouble getting. It has a couple other B vitamins. And there's a lot of algae-based um, omega-3s. This is new to me because this is the one that I think is the most potent, has the most milligrams of EPA, DHA on the market and a little bit of vitamin D. So these together give you a real nice mix of, um, if we were to have uh, Juliana Heber and Ray Cronites in the room, Ray's a real expert on uh, nutrition that's needed for planned diets, and he would tell you B12, D, omega-3, zinc, iodine are, um, are the biggies, and you can cover your bases in a very simple way, and actually an organic vitamin, which isn't such a bad deal. So bad these are all available on you know, uh, online sites. All right, this is the last eight minutes now. This is really fascinating stuff, I believe. This is in this realm of vegan plus. What can we do to be even better? Because believe it or not, don't look around. Not everybody in this way is thin, perfect blood pressure, perfect energy. So this is a challenge. What would happen to our lifespan if we could cure all cancer, heart disease, stroke, and diabetes today? We would go from an average age of 78 to an average age of 91 in America, 13 year increase. Pretty good jump. We got a bigger jump by toilets and, uh, and DPT vaccines and such and penicillin. But if we cured every case of cancer, heart disease, stroke, and diabetes, uh, 13 years. What would happen if we could stop junk accumulating in our cells, which is the current leading theory of why we age and ultimately die, our cells get congested and congested and congested with the byproducts of metabolism and at some point it becomes so inefficient they can't function, they die, we might be able to extend life by 30 years. So wouldn't it be great to feel good, know you're helping animals, know you're helping the planet, and actually plan on having good health longer than the average population and all. So plants are going to help us, but they may not be enough. Uh, it turns out that there's strong data in the scientific literature and just epidemiology that when the human state is in a fasting state, there are responses that the body has very primitive to protect, preserve, and repair the body because if we're not getting nutrition, we have to shut down, slow down, repair, make more efficient. And one of the things that happens in a fasting state is we activate a process, a fancy name I'll tell you in a minute, that helps start to clean out debris, waste, and damage in cells and repair the body. So there is, a, there is a phenomenon called overeating, chronic overeating. Again, Ray Cronite, one of my new gurus, is very big on talking about the fact it's common in the vegan world to say you can eat everything you want. Well, it's probably true of cruciferous vegetables, kale, bok choy. You're not going to gain weight eating large, large bowls full. But I do believe you can gain weight eating large amounts of potatoes and starches and lentils and peas and beans wonderful foods, but why isn't everybody real thin? And maybe we should start talking about eating well, but not as much, uh, and purposely taking a break. So I'll introduce you, if you don't know, under the names of Pritikin and Ornish and Esselstyn and such, Dr. Walter Longo, a 50-year-old uh, scientist born in Genoa, Italy, spent most of his life in Calabria, southern Italy, where they have exceptional lifespan. He met, grew up with many people over the age of 100. Uh, 22 years ago, moved to Los Angeles to get his PhD. He actually moved to the United States to be a jazz guitarist and spent a year in North of Dallas uh, playing in bands and such. He still occasionally can be seen in LA playing in a band. But decided at age 20, I don't want to do jazz guitar, I want to do aging research. That's kind of an interesting little thought. 
and went to um, UCLA where they had a program and got a PhD with some of the world leaders. If anybody remembers the biosphere where these crazy people locked themselves up for two years and almost died of starvation, that was his whole team when he was getting his PhD. Moved to University of Southern California where he now directs a research institute and became, I think, without question, the world's leading expert in nutrition and longevity, having identified fancy names, IGF-1, TOR, PK, um, has been nominated for the Nobel Prize in Medicine two years ago at age 48, but a 74-year-old Japanese scientist was given the award for very similar research, in part out of his age, he will win it. But he has identified that it's very, um, amateurish to say protein, where do you get your protein? You, you know, the protein is made of amino acids and every amino acid causes a different response in the body. And you don't have to be a food psychologist or, or a PhD. I'm just gonna tell you, plant amino acid breakdowns are much more favorable to aging than animal-based amino acid uh, breakdowns in animal flesh. There's an amino acid called leucine and an amino acid called methionine that activate aging pathways and they're largely found in meats and they're very minimally found in plants. And he's responsible for all that and how when you eat a healthy whole food plant diet after childhood, you have a low level of a um, growth factor called insulin-like growth factor one. And if you look at people over the age of 100, they also have low levels when you eat meat, it rises. It doesn't matter if it's grass-fed beef or uh, cage-free chickens, when you eat animal flesh, the amino acids activate these paths. You raise uh, your IGF-1 and you increase your risk of aging and cancer. So this is a busy slide, but he, he was a lucky bright man because everybody in the world 20 years ago was studying mice. He said, mice are complicated little beasts. I'm gonna study yeast. I'm gonna see what happens with different nutrition in yeast, single cell yeast. I'm gonna see if I can identify it and identify some of these uh, biochemical pathways. Well, it turns out then he went to worms, then he went to flies, and then he rolled the dice and said, do you think we actually have the same pathways in, in mammals and ultimately humans? And he kind of is the world's leader because it turns out this research he could do in yeast only because they're so simple and it was so easy to do is preserved uh, all the way to our bodies. Very interesting idea. So this pathway called TOR uh, IGF-1 and all, uh, which he identified, are very important in our own health and our diet. So if you look at a group of people that live in South America and have low IGF-1 levels their whole life because of a genetic defect, um, they don't have cancer. Their whole life they have a low IGF-1. They don't get type 2 diabetes. Uh, they don't grow very much because their growth hormone is low. Uh, that's um, uh, Jamie, Jamie, Jamie Velasquez, a researcher, and it's in Ecuador, it's near Quito, where this uh, genetic group lives, and Dr. Longo's been going down for many years studying these people. As an example, if we can eat our way to a low IGF-1, and they had a genetic reason, we'll, be, we'll have better height than they do, but we will have a low diabetic and a low cancer risk uh, also. So optimal cardiac nutrition. Fasting for more than a day, actually fasting is by definition 36 hours or more according to scientists, protects the body from damage, from chemotherapy and other uh, insults, releases stem cells from our bone marrow to rejuvenate our body, but water fasting is challenging. And a lot of people have done a one day water fast, some have gone to True North and done a longer water fast. Dr. Longo was concerned that this is not for everybody, uh, you can uh, run into some problems. So he developed a program in the last 10 years called FMD, Fasting Mimicking Diet. You can eat food, but the body senses a fast. You can't eat a lot of food, but you can eat food. If the constituents of the diet are constructed in a way that they don't activate these aging pathways, they are sensed by the body as if there's no food being eaten. The stomach sees food. So it's a very low protein, so that there goes your meat very low sugar, there goes your junk, 800 calorie a day plant-based diet. And that's when I got very interested in Dr. Longo a few years ago because he kept talking about plant diets, plant diets, plant diets. And then when this program was available as a commercial program, which it is, um, I got very interested and started uh, using it in my own life and in my patients. So it is a program that was studied in yeast, mice, and humans 
that's been shown to lower IGF-1 and promote regeneration of the body because it shuts down aging pathways, turns on reparative pathways, and floods your blood with stem cells. You can go to Tijuana and get stem cells, or you can eat, it turns out, I'll show you, five days a month. So what's the program? It's soups, it's bars of nuts, so you can't be that allergic. Teas, drinks, olives, even a little cacao powder snack that five days in a row is consumed, and it's actually available from University of Southern California. You don't create your own. You can do it once a month, five days in a row, every six months or every 12 months. You could do it once in a row, month after month. I personally have done it eight of the last 12 months. It's plant-based, I will warn you. There is some honey in one of the items. They're getting rid of it. It's uh, gluten-free, but um, it, you know if you have a, uh, objection to honey, you'll have to wait a bit till they redo that. Um, and what's the data? So after years, I'm sorry again, after years of animal data, Dr. Longo published in February last year, a year ago, 100 patients who ate a controlled diet or did this five days in a row a month, three months in a row. If you were on the control diet after three months, they let you do the fasting mimicking diet for three months. So they had a whole bunch of people at the end. They published this paper. And the data, what happens to body weight after three months, five days in a row, each month for three months, body weight goes down, but it's all belly fat. This is the real flat belly diet, not the bone broth one that my friend Dr. Petrucci is selling right now on Amazon. Belly fat goes down, weight circumference goes down. The fourth one, muscle mass actually goes up. Because if you're an older person, you don't want to lose muscle. If you're a younger person, you don't want to necessarily lose muscle. If I give you chemotherapy or Zika, you're going to lose weight, but you're going to lose a lot of muscle and fat. This diet preserves muscle mass. Blood pressure goes down. I've had patients for the first time get good natural blood pressure control using this program. But over there is stem cells and C-reactive protein, and a very, very interesting boost in stem cells of which I'm unaware of any other natural program where you can, at will, flood your blood with useful cells. If you start the program less healthy than average, you get even more weight loss, 10 pound average, abdominal, but I've had many people lose way more than 10 pounds, belly fat, you get more results if you start. Look at IGF-1, way down after three months if you start as an unhealthy person with a high IGF-1. So, I've done this, and I don't recommend you do it as much as I have, but in the first three months, I dropped 18 pounds without an effort, and I had not dropped 18 pounds. I would tell you, I weighed 202 pounds as a 41-year vegan. Every day of my life, I didn't even step on the scale. I, whatever I tried, I just was a little thick. I wasn't happy with it, but you know what? I was working hard and doing what I could do. Three months later, I dropped 18 pounds, and I was 25 pounds. I never gained it back. It's the easiest program. I've been through my blood pressures down 20 millimeters of mercury. Um, there's a cost to it. You have to buy the food from the University of Southern California. They are progressively dropping the price. The average American spends $35 a day on food. On the cruise ship, you're probably spending more. This program might be $40 to $50 a day for the cost of what they provide. Um, but it's, it's medical food, and it's whole food, and it's the real McCoy. Uh, here are stem cells at baseline, stem cells boost up. This is all very high-level published research. Um, I'm just going to tell you, if you're a human getting chemotherapy and you eat this diet before, during, and after, you kill more cancer cells and you preserve more natural cells. Studies going on all over the world right now, Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, using fasting mimicking diet. It's actually got a trade name, Chemoleave. It's not available yet because they need more data, but they have very exciting data. Um, fasting mimicking diet creates weight loss, cholesterol, blood sugar regeneration and rejuvenation, you can also get by a prolonged water fast, but you can work. I mean, I work every day, I do this, I do a little yoga, I don't work out, uh, and it's real food, uh, which is cool. So the aging process itself of fasting mimicking diet has huge potential for a variety of diseases. You guys know all the great references out there. Uh, I'll just tell you one as I shut down. How many people know what plant-based nutrition support group.org is? I wanted to mention this, and I'm glad, okay, yay, Dale. Um, four years ago this month, Paul Chapman, the man in Detroit, called me and said, I eat the Esselstyn diet, I avoided bypass, I'm lonely, wife, co-workers, friends think I'm nuts eating my kale and my brown rice.
Can we make a support group for other people like me? I said, yes, we'll have 20 people for sure every three months. The first meeting, 150 people showed up. It wasn't a hospital-based thing. It was two guys and a, and a PowerPoint. And now we have 5,000 members in Detroit that are a member of the BBNSG.org. We have no funding of any real nature. And we have amazing meetings every six weeks with Dr. Bernard, Dr. Essis, and Rip Essis, and Julianna have a ritual on and on. We've got this group, you know, really, I often do this, I have people in the audience, how many of you have lost 20 pounds since doing this, 30, 40? We, you get to 100 and we got a whole bunch of people stand up. It's absolutely a revolution. It's a great website. You can do it in your town. And if you can find a couple doctors, nurses, dietitians, it'd be great. Uh, if you can, restaurant, Dr. Gregor Dunn. Okay, it's getting close to lunchtime. Um, I want you to study, if you're taking notes, if you just Google Prolon, P-R-O-L-O-N, or if you want the website, it's Prolon FMD, P-R-O-L-O-N F-M-D dot com. It's a beautiful, informative website. This is not Nutrisystem Marie Osmond. This is a program that is changing medicine through food unlike any other I've ever seen in my career. Uh, I can vouch for the scientific, you know, strength to it all. Um, if you want, you can, if you're a podcaster, put in Dr. Walter Longo's name. There's many podcasts uh, that he's done and talks about it, YouTubes. Um, learn more about it. It might be, if you're frustrated, a way to um, accelerate your hitting your goal. Very cautious if you're very old. Very cautious if you're a type 1 diabetic. Very cautious if you're underweight or serious medical problems. They have a medical director you can talk to at the company before embarking. But if you are just want to help your body, um, you know, it's a great thing to do. Many people report pains in their joints and their back and their skin and all kinds of things are better. And there's a reason to believe that's true because of stem cell. So a little twist on what you typically hear, because I do believe we can take plants and push it even further and get uh, even more dramatic results, a bit of radical approach. Few questions and then it's lunch time. Yes. K2 brand, if you ask what I like, it's called Mega, it's called Microbiome Labs. Microbiome Labs, it's called Mega Quino. Microbiome Labs will get you. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just make a question. If you did a chelation program, the chemicals can't only identify calcium. They might bind magnesium, they might bind other. It's always recommended to take a multi mineral vitamin while you're doing chelation to supplement those others. And most multi mineral minerals. Yeah, you urinate them out. They're, they're identifiable in the urine. So they bind the tight and you urinate them out. You drink a lot of water, they're not processed too. Yes? Yeah. So the question is if it takes 15 years for ex smokers to get back to normal rates. Um, you know, you can see benefit in three to four weeks. Dr. Gornish and Dr. Gretz and others have published that. Um, you know, how do you ever become heart attack proof? I don't think we can claim absolutely. I mean, you don't do this for a year, go back to your diet because you cleaned out your arteries. You just you dramatically lower your risk. It's unknown. I mean, you, you saw the only data in the world on cap data, 51% versus 37%. Now, at 10 years, is that down to 20%? I know. Yeah, five years, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, so six years, whole food, plant-based, still high cholesterol. Very common, people get frustrated. I didn't, you know, genetics are a factor. Your exact diet could be a factor. Um, and you know, there's natural agents that lower cholesterol, red yeast, rice, and amla, and bergamot. And, you know, I use a lot of those because I think we can do real well, but we need a little push and help there and there. Yes, Does what? Yeah. Yeah. 
what the fasting vinegar diet helped autoimmune liver cirrhosis, I don't think it's been studied, it's been studied for what's called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is very common. Uh, I don't think that's known yet. You can always call the company and ask me this one. Comparable data on K2 versus, versus EDTA, safety-wise, Yeah, it's a question of K2, EDTA, there's no comparable data. And, and most people should do both, you know, if they didn't. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. There's a number of companies. I use one made in Orlando called Nanobac. N-A-N-O-B-A-C. You got to buy it from Mr. Mezzo, the company, in particular. But he has the published data. He's the guy that's got the science study. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. 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 So the question is, this particular woman had chemo, did her own brand of fasting during her chemotherapy, because uh, Prolon wasn't out, and Prolon's not really, uh, you know, it's not out yet for chemo, it, the data's there, but it's not out yet. Uh, there is, that's why Dr. Longo's been on that path. There has been data about using water fasting, always in a hospital setting, always monitored, um, and there was data, and he's trying to make it more, you know, you can eat during it, you, and you don't want to lose weight for a lot of people during chemotherapy, they're already losing weight. So uh, he's done that to take that to a safer level. I mean, it's safe to say, yes? Yeah, so is AFib and arrhythmia and heart disease? Absolutely. Do we have much data about any lifestyle measures other than weight loss? Because weight loss, sleep apnea, stress in the heart, which is always a good idea. We don't. We don't have published data. Um, it's a good question. So. Do it this way for all the other reasons. The weight loss you might enjoy might also help. Atrial fib. We eat more magnesium than the rest of humanity, which helps heart arrhythmia. Well, a lot of people with atrial fibrillation, yeah. Well, but they may need medication too. Yeah. You don't want to have a stroke just because you're eating with each other. Yes, sir. He will, you, you, people have tried, somebody died in Italy doing it because they got the mix wrong and he got very nervous about that and ticked off a cancer patient and made their own. So he's got it patented, trademarked, he's very emphatic. All, it, all his shares in the company are in a research fund, he makes no money from it. He wants you to do it the way the science is behind it. Individual, there is, I'll tell you, there's a growing interest Ketogenic diets, low carb, higher fat diets are the rage in California. You can do it with plants. I mean, there's a Facebook user group of 50,000 people that chat with each other about plant-based ketogenic diet for weight loss and diabetes reversal. There's no meat, there's no cheese, there's no dairy, there's no eggs, there's no bacon. There's walnuts and there's, you know, um, uh, avocados and nuts. And so, you know, that is worth researching. I talk about that on that Rich Roll podcast. I think it's fascinating. Dr. Longo's program is basically a plant-based ketogenic diet for only five days, not for 50 days or 500 days like they do with meat. Yeah. Both. Yeah, so the CIMT does both. There's actually three parts to it. One is just percentage of blockage, and the second part is the thickness. So, it, well, the thickness is the unique thing. You never get at a hospital, a church, a life scan, the thickness measure. And that's the one that, the 2,000 research studies on humans are using that technique. It's just not widely available. Yes, sir? What causes life protein A, and how is it treated? Okay, lipoprotein A, I, yeah, I didn't go deep on. It's a kind of cholesterol you have to have, a $20 blood test. 20, 65 million Americans have an elevated lipoprotein A. Nobody checks for it. There's a lipoprotein A foundation that will tell you, get yours checked, a research foundation. The standard statement is, okay, your doctor, you forced your doctor to check your lipoprotein A. It should be less than 30 years. Came back 300, 10 times normal. I would be very worried about what your arteries are like. I'd get an ultrasound or a CAT scan, or maybe you already know you have a problem. The standard answer is eat a healthy diet, exercise, perfect blood pressure, perfect blood sugar, perfect weight, don't smoke, exercise, sleep well. We don't know what to do for the lipoprotein A. The reality is we know that niacin, a B vitamin that's widely available, lowers lipoprotein A. It's such a cheap vitamin, 
that's at least part of the reason. There's never been a large study, 100 people, 1,000 people, you get nice and you get placebo, let's see who goes to the emergency room in the next five years. So we can only speculate. And I don't think anybody's going to do that study. There's a typically a fifteen to $20,000 drug that's in the works in terms of research, showing some early positive results, not available. Um, these injectable cholesterol drugs that came out three years ago, lower lipoprotein A, they're not approved for use, but some people can't take the statins because of muscle aches or brain fog or blood sugar, and they end up on those drugs and their lipoprotein A comes down. I personally carefully treat people with niacin, and I tell them I can't prove you it's going to help. But the numbers come down. Yeah. A lipoprotein A? There's no B. Well, there's an APO B. APO B is LDL cholesterol. Lipoprotein A is a whole other little thing floating in your blood, hopefully just a little bit, but 65 million Americans have. Hi. Yeah. Vericosane. Lovely lights. Yeah, and varicose veins, you know, I, I'm not the board certified vein specialist. There are, and of course, everybody wants to strip them and laser them and all the rest. There are a couple, I mean, nutritional ways. There's a, there's a, there's a supplement called rutin. It's a very potent antioxidant from plants, R-U-T-E-I-N, and some people believe that helps with varicose veins. There are some natural vein therapy vitamins out there that have that and other stuff. Chestnut, I think there's black chestnut supplements. Maybe one of I see three hands in my hand. I'm made for I don't want to be rude. Yeah, right. Well, that's, it's asking about, yeah, so there isn't anything. I agree, you're right. I won't repeat your question. You're right. It's a problem. I don't know if that theory, a few people left in the world think that theory has got some value. That bacteria might have a role in atherosclerosis. I didn't show it. I showed a couple of suggestions yesterday that your oral health relates to your cardiovascular artery health. If you, if you have a 90% blockage in your carotid and you scoop that cholesterol out during an operation, which is a frequently done operation, you can find bacteria in the plaque that's dental bacteria. Um, and that's led to trials that have tried to treat heart disease with antibiotics. So far they've been you know, negative and it's not part of our program. Yep. Well, the fasting mimicking diet, there's an ongoing National Institute of Health trial highly funded on it. Their website will advise, talk to your doctor or talk to their doctor, be cautious. Your blood sugar is going to drop. And I, I wouldn't take my metformin if I were on metformin doing that diet. Yeah, right. So you need to be cautious because you'll get another broken arm, unfortunately. Yes, sir. Uh, as far as the FMD. I can't hear you. The FMD, you mentioned that some people tried to mimic it and did the yeah. combination wrong and failed and were, suffered for it, but all it is is a, it's an alternative to fasting, so if, if they can fast, then that would still be better, right? It's more than that. It's, it's the, it's, you know, it took them 10 years, you know, why is there hibiscus tea, not green tea? Why is there lemon tea, not you know, peppermint tea? Why is the minestrone soup a very unusual degree of spices and herbs? And he'll tell you, you know, Every time you change a component, like some people want a cup of coffee with it because it's supposed to be five days without coffee. It's probably no harm. Some people actually think fasting with coffee is a good idea, but he never studied it with coffee. He'll tell you, you no, know, we've got something pretty amazing. Why not just do it that way? But if you said for five days a month, I'll eat 800 calories of plants, you'd probably have a very good shot of helping to control your weight. We overeat. That's certainly the common message. Be careful on the ship. Certain, certain religions fast during the day. Any, right. Any benefits to a, you know, to yeah, the Ramadan? Are... I've got data to talk about. Ramadan, the problem is they go, you know, from eight hours to 15 hours, depending on the time of year, and then they eat like crazy people, some of them. I mean, I'm not being at all offensive to them, but the published data is their overall calorie intake isn't that much less in the month. There is overall an average drop in blood pressure, blood, body weight, blood sugar. But it's unclear if there's much of a health benefit. The Latter-day Saint, the Mormons, fast regularly. There is data from Utah that they have less cardiovascular disease and registries in those. Or at least Latter-day Saints that practice fasting have less heart disease than Latter-day Saints at home. There isn't as much data as we'd like to have about cardiac benefits to fasting. I think it's, 
if it'll help you control weight, blood pressure, blood sugar in a way that's without drugs, it's awesome. So the question is, can you lower your calcium score? And you can. I mean, I showed one slide. Um, the only thing we know that's been shown to do it is chelation. None of Dr. Ornish's, none of Dr. Houseson's studies did calcium measurements. Now, when Dr. Ornish lowered plaque, he must have presumably lowered calcium, but it wasn't measured. Um, and is that the goal? Well, some researchers would say, once you got plaque, Calcium makes your artery tougher, stronger, less likely to blow up like a volcano and cause a heart attack. It's a controversial area. But in the research studies that was used during the oral one, as your calcium score went down, people reported feeling better, stress test got better. It seemed like it was a good idea. It's not a goal hardly anybody talks about, but it's possible. Is there any validity to baby aspirin? The baby aspirin, uh, you know, the, U.S. Preventive Task Force, the body that tries to analyze this, said if you're 50 to 70 in good health, aspirin a day may lower your risk of heart disease and colorectal cancer. So if you really got a great diet and you're healthy, you already got a pretty low risk of both colorectal cancer and heart disease or eating a lot of fiber-rich foods. Um, and the benefit is very tiny, but it's there. So heart patients largely should be. There are some natural alternatives. I'm not in favor of natokinase. I've got some people on how many baby aspirin a day if you've had bypass stents, TIA stroke. Okay. But for the general public, most people actually don't need it. I don't take a baby aspirin a day. I just don't do it. Last hand, yes. Yes, I was wondering about research on the Seventh Day Adventists because they've been vegetarian, I don't know, plant based right. for their entire. Religious and your, life. your question about the Adventists was? Well, I'm wondering if the research, uh, if there is any research on their diet and heart. Yeah, that's yes. a, the Seventh day Adventists, now there's over 100,000 of them all over the world in research studies asking 52 pages of questions and follow up every four years. And clearly, omnivore, vegetarian, vegan, heart disease rates, diabetes type 2 rates, obesity rates. Certain cancers, ovarian cancer rates, prostate, are much lower in those that fill out a form that allows them to classify them as vegan versus vegetarian versus uh, omnivore. So there is, that is a very strong data set. When you look at overall survival, the vegans do extremely well and better than the omnivores, but people that eat a serving of fish or two a week, unfortunately for some of us, beat out the pure vegans in the seven-day Adventist study. Um, it's just, I gotta tell the truth. Now, with the vegans taking an algae-based omega-3 have equal to have been superior to the fish eaters, and people eating fish in the 80s, is it the same pure clean waters that we have in 2018? Are questions, but just being honest with the fact. All right, you're so nice, last question. I do one last question. Shout it out. Yeah, it's dense, so you got that. Right. Are the stents effective now? Would there be any problems with the stents? Because I'm on the plant based diet. So, number one, she has the cutest earrings in the room. You know, so, her question is she's had four stents, is doing a plant diet a problem? Now, it's a tremendous advantage. There's no theoretical problem you come up with any kind to impact you know, the benefit of stents. It's just going to benefit, you know everywhere else that you've got not necessarily to worry about, but realistically could become a problem. So absolutely, if I could legislate that everybody with a stent goes through an Ornish or a Pritikin program and adopt the planned diet and wouldn't pay for anything else unless they do that, that would be a great thing. Thank you all very much. Have lunch.